I think where people get hung up is they, they go keto for a month, two months, three months, and you know, they're still eating 20 carbs, 30 carbs a day. And they're just like confused, like, why am I gassing out? Like, why don't I have like a high capacity for like quick, short bursts? And really it's just, your metabolism hasn't had a chance to like switch over. And like, you haven't developed that metabolic capability to like run a, like a bunch of sprints in a row, like because you've always been reliant on your whatever, your glycogen stores. So I, I think it just takes time, some time to shift. All right, hello everyone, and thanks for coming back to another episode of Plant Free MD. I'm your host, Dr. Anthony Chafee, and today I have a special guest, a uh, good guy I've gotten to know over the past several months, uh, John J. Chavez. How are you doing, John? Hey, Dr. Chafee, I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Um, I know we just got introduced a little bit here in the last few minutes, but um, yeah. I'm, I'm real excited to be here. Thanks. Yeah. Well, well, it's a pleasure to have you on, man. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed talking to you and, and hearing your story and hearing your improvements going on a carnivore diet. Um, you have a pretty unique background. You're an elite, world-class wrestler going to an Ivy League school, um, had some troubles and then found a carnivore diet and sort of used that to to, to, to pull yourself out of it. And you showed me some uh, several pictures of yourself you know, of, of, you know, the months going on and you, you went from out of, I wouldn't have known you were a wrestler before that. And then all of a sudden, like, okay, that, that dude shredded. So, um, you know, big, big sort of improvements there. So congratulations on that. And, um, but you know, for people, uh, that don't, that don't know you, but how can you tell us a bit about yourself and, and your background and how you got into a carnivore diet? Yeah. So, uh, I guess a little bit about me. I, uh, I wrestled for Cornell University. I was a D1 All-American in 2018, world team member, um, three-time Fargo national champ in high school. So, you know, pretty successful wrestler, wrestled in the worlds, uh, like age division, senior worlds. And so, yeah, that was like a big part of my life and um, all of that. But um, really, I didn't go carnivore until maybe five years or let's see, maybe four or five years after I stopped wrestling in 2018. So I, I had a big chunk of time. And so, you know, a lot of people might assume it was related to improving my athletic performance or, um, you know, just trying to help me perform better at school. But really it was more about combating like my own um, symptoms of like mental illness, depression, anxiety. And, uh, you know, over time they got pretty severe and, yeah, you know, I could totally explain more about that whole um, process and how I came to get here. So, yeah, that'd be great. So, yeah, so where were you at when you decided to go carnivore and what made you decide to hop into that? Yeah, so I guess uh, the reason I got into carnivore requires like a bit of a prelude. So, I, uh, yeah, so I left. Cornell in the spring of 2019 and I left mid semester and I was just having all these issues with depression and anxiety and performance anxiety. And there was just like so much pressure on me to perform and like at least self-imposed. And, um, uh, I really just wasn't making the cut. And, um, so I, I actually ended up withdrawing from the university in February. Uh, maybe the middle, late February. And uh, um, like my coach told me like, don't do it because you're going to get stuck with a huge bill. And at this point I said, I don't care. Like, I'm just like going to leave. Mm -hmm. So I left university and sure enough, got this like <laughs> massive bill that I got to pay before I go back. And yeah, so life went on and uh, I did like an internship and, and this and that. And then I, I kind of just, you know, I couldn't pay off my bill, so I couldn't go back. And uh, this is kind of like where things started to go south for me, I think. Um, so really like my mental health kind of took a nosedive from like that summer onward. And I really had like really intense depression, anxiety. Um, like my anxiety was like so intense that I, I had a hard time like going outside and really functioning as a human being. Uh, I had like severe depression. I, I really isolated myself. I, I didn't make any friends and, um, 
at least like for for a little while and you know my girlfriend broke up with me and i was just in a real bad spot <laughs> and uh mm-hmm. yeah so i um yeah i went through like i worked construction for a few years i uh worked security and i finally like made enough money to like um like pay off my school bill and like finally be able to go back but I had also like gotten on medication during this time and uh, they put me on an antipsychotic called Invega. And I was on that medication starting in, let's see, it would have been April of 20 of 2020. And you can pretty much see the difference like immediately in like the, like the chronology of the photos where I immediately gained like 20 pounds and it, I, you know, I tried keep like keeping it off and, um, you know, I was like running, I was trying to eat a little bit healthier, but really as like the years went on, like I ended up weighing like at my most, like maybe 235 pounds. And I, in college, I wrestled 165 pounds mm-hmm. and at the world championships, I wrestled 158 pounds. So this is like a massive weight gain from this, uh, from this medication. And, you know, I can't just blame it all on the meds. Like I ate like shit and, you know, I ate whatever made me feel good. And, um, yeah, you know, it's another way to live. Um, especially it's, it's just like disappointing feeling like you're just wasting your potential and your youth and, you know, but I really tried everything and I just, I couldn't get out of this rut, uh, this mental rut that I was in. And, and it was like so many different things, you know, it's like my, my self appearance and, you know, but most of all, it's just like this, like huge anxiety and almost like a sort of paralysis. So anyways, I'm living life, I'm suffering and I'm able to go back to Cornell in let's see, fall of 2022. And I'm going to finish my senior year, get my degree. And so I go out there and I start like getting back into shape a little bit because I start coaching wrestling club. And so I, I, I'm meeting people, you know, talking to people and it's, it's, it's pretty tough, you know, because last time I was there, I was 22 years old and, you know, had a six pack and had all these friends on the wrestling team. And I'm kind of starting back there, like from scratch, like everyone, almost everyone I knew from the wrestling team had like graduated and there were a few guys, but so I'm starting from scratch. I'm, fat. I, and so, you know, I really have to put myself out there and, uh, and I get through it, you know, it's, uh, I go to class, I try and self soothe. I do a lot of breath work. Um, but you know, I'm just miserable and it's during this time, really, I would heard of the carnivore diet, um, prior maybe, but I really started to like set my intentions like in during the semester to like, uh, to like get on this diet but I don't feel like I'm able to really get on the diet like while I'm at school just because my classes are difficult and I just don't know if I, I didn't think I could take the transition. Mm-hmm. So I made it through the semester and um, go home for winter break. And on December 6th of 2020, I started a carnivore diet and I followed it like to the T like, I think, the one thing I had that wasn't on carnivore in that month was I, I would have tea and I would have, uh, I had a little bit of horseradish on Christmas. And, um, so during that time from December 6th to, um, maybe the end of January, I went from 220 pounds to, uh, 187 pounds. Nice. So yeah, <laughs> I lost 33 pounds <laughs> in two months. And, uh, as a wrestler, you know, it's like, all right, four pounds a week. Good job, bro. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, got through it and I, I noticed that my mood like really improved significantly. My self image improved significantly. Um, I actually felt like m- my emotions were returning and I also didn't mention, I, I got off the medication at the same time. I, uh, <laughs> I started carnivore. So, you know, really just dove in with both feet, you know, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, much to 
yeah, the ghast of any psychiatrist anywhere. But um, yeah, so uh, yeah. Anyways, things worked out all right, and uh, I went through the semester, and I really just sailed through that that whole uh, semester. There it was, you know, made more friends. Uh, people, I could just. I felt like people wanted to talk to me more. Uh, I was healthier. Uh, I started I started running again, and that was something I couldn't do while I was overweight like that. Like it would just destroy my ankles, and um, yeah. And I, the semester it was honestly my easiest semester at Cornell, like out of all eight semesters. And yeah, it was just a it was a, it was a great thing, and. Um, but I, it, it wasn't like a, fa- a fairy tale because at the end of that uh, semester, I, I was going to like walk the stage, and my family was all out, and we were gonna, we were gonna, you know, celebrate. And I wake up on the morning of graduation, and I, my my knee is locked at like a forty five degree angle, and I can't walk, so <laughs> I've got to um, get some crutches and like put my suit on and. I crutched across the stage. So it was a little bit of, uh, I don't know, karma or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> irony, poetic justice. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so got through it. And it turned out I had like uh, this weird knee injury where my femur broke and um, I couldn't like, the, the the chunk like locked my knee up. So a couple months later, or like what, I think maybe two Two and a half weeks later, I got knee surgery and yeah, I uh, spent the summer recovering and really just dialing in my health and like working on some other protocols. Um, as a wrestler, you know, like I really did a lot of research into like optimization and like how to be healthier. And um, it's just like a little interesting to me how like I ended up like so far from like the picture of health, you know, and here I am like after all of this and I feel like I'm like the healthiest I've ever been in my life. Even whenever uh, I was competing like at at a world level in wrestling and you know, I'm, I'm I'm like six weeks out of surgery right now, like in the gym, like I feel stronger than ever faster. And yeah, it's uh, it's pretty astounding and nice. Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor at Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. For those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the Carnivore market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products that will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, Check it out using my discount code Anthony to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right, thanks, guys. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. So, have you have you you've been doing wrestling club sort of thing, uh, coaching mm-hmm. that? Have you started wrestling again yourself? So, I'm just a little bit hesitant to start wrestling again. I did the wrestling club, um, you know, all of fall and spring semester, and. Um, I really pushed my knee yeah. that spring semester. I, I, I started feeling the, um, a little bit of pain in it that first semester, that second semester. And, um, I just kind of pushed through it. I would give it a few days off. I'd go back and I just assumed I had like torn my meniscus very early on. And I, I just figured it was a partial tear and it was all good, but it turned out it was this whole thing. And so that's why, I don't know. I've, I have not been back on the mat since, uh, well, actually, I, I have been coaching the local high school team a little bit, um, you know, a little bit of like of armchair coaching, well, a little bit. Yeah, uh, <laughs> they're good kids. Uh, it's nice because uh, sometimes I feel like you get in there in the high school room and the kids don't. Oh, well, OK. So last time I was in the high school room, I was like fat and, you know, didn't look like a wrestler. Like you said. And, <laughs> but uh, now it's like every every kid is like you know, 10 hut, like, yes, sir. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of funny, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I think I'm just going to coach that high school team this year and, uh, uh, it'll be, you know, help them out. And that was my wrestling club from maybe fourth or maybe sixth and seventh grade. I wrestled at that club. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but it was, it was just the local place. And, nice. Um, yeah. yeah. So maybe I, I, I would love to like wrestle again, but it's just, uh, What's in terms name? of Greco Roman wrestling, it's, it's what? opportunities to train are really far and few between. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's, um, maybe a difficult outside, you know, after college and things like that. Yeah. I don't, I don't really know. I suppose you have to have sort of a dedicated sort of training sort of facility on your yeah. own or with others. I guess you could, you know, if you were going for like an Olympic spot, you could train at, mm -hmm. you know, the Olympic training centers and things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I spent a lot of time at the Olympic training center, um, yeah. over the years, but it's just, uh, it is tough, you know, um, because most guys who are doing that are either on a WCAP program. Mm -hmm. And so they're getting sponsorship by the army, they're part of the army or they're, uh, they're getting like some sort of national team stipend. So they're on the national team and they're getting paid by USA wrestling. And, mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it's a little difficult to do without funding. Um, yeah. And you know, I could get a job and do all that, but, mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, yeah, it is, uh, I have conflicting feelings. I don't know. It's, uh, <laughs> something I would love to do, but something I'm really a little scared of. And yeah, I don't well, it's also, it's also early days after your surgery, obviously, you know, you don't, you don't want right. to come back too early and, and mess that up again. But, right. you know, once you're rehabbing, if, if you felt good, you know, what are the opportunities apart from making a run at the Olympics, what are, what are the opportunities for wrestling uh, post, post-graduation? Yeah. So, um, I think if I were to like return to wrestling, Olympics would be like, I visualized it in my mind, like what it would be like to, mm -hmm. to like go to that tournament. And yeah. I know like, yeah, yeah. Right. So the number one guy at 77 kilos, his name's like Levi something, or another, He's from Hungary. And I remember I was wrestling with him um, in 2018. And me and this dude were like toe to toe. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, wow, that dude is number one in the world right now. And four years ago, I was like his equal. And I'm just like, wow, like that is, uh, I don't know. Yeah. That's a little tough. But, uh, well, but it's yeah. also encouraging, you know. You, because you you know where you're at, you know it's not like this is some some sort of unknown quantity and like this is the number one guy in the world. Like oh maybe I'm not good enough for him, but you know you are. You know you've mm -hmm. been just right up with this guy, you know. So you know you get back in training and you you know you start working again and you're feeling good and like you say you're feeling healthier and stronger than you ever have in your life. So you know you absolutely you know could get right back in there and maybe even have an advantage. You never know. No, absolutely. Like, I'm just like, you know, I'm at the spot. I never really feel like I committed and, you know, at least not a hundred percent. Like there was stuff I wasn't doing that I could be doing like film. And, mm -hmm. um, that was, that was a big thing was I really just didn't watch a lot of film and, and then my diet was always inconsistent and, um, you know, I wasn't coming in every day, um, being my best. So, and, um, and you were still toe to toe with the guy. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Right. So you, you, were, you were phoning it in and you're still with this dude. And, you know, now you're in a different mindset. You have a very different diet. And, you know, if you did go back into it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be to just half ass it. You know, it would be because that's something that you're dedicated to and you really wanted to do. So I think that would be, it would be a very different, uh, very different um, program there. Yeah, that's part of it. You know, you don't want to half-ass it because it hurts. You know, <laughs> like you, you do, all, you spend all this time and you put all this effort. Like even in wrestling, half-assing it takes a lot. Still, you know, like yeah, so, um, yeah. And then you, and then you just get, end up getting your ass kicked, and you're like that doesn't that doesn't feel good. You work your ass, and it's harder. You know, when you're when you're not as good, you're not as in shape, you're not as as disciplined as the other guy it's harder. It's hard to lose a wrestling yes. match. Yes. Like it, it takes more. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. And you knew, you know, you you know, you're, it, you're to blame with that, you know, whenever you did everything you could, like there's nothing else to say about it. You know, it's like, yeah. But yeah. Well, so 
so speaking of that, you know, you're saying that you're feeling strong, you're feeling better. You know, how is it now training on a carnivore diet versus training on your previous diet? Yeah. So really, I mean, it's really hard to make a comparison almost just because of the massive weight difference. Um, but comparing it's like training or even when whenever you were, I was around 22. Yeah. yeah even um, when you're at your peak. Yeah. Yeah. So whenever I was like 22 at my peak and really killing it, um, I feel like my testosterone is definitely higher on the carnivore diet. Hmm. Uh, maybe I'm just a little bit older. Um, that could be part of it, but, um, you know, so there's that. And then my endurance is better. Like I can like at the gym now, like I can just run sprints and it's like, I don't get tired. I don't know. Um, yeah. there's, there's other stuff too. Like, like I feel like I move, I'm moving better. And that's maybe partly because like, I've just been focusing on, um, uh, training, like doing functional training. And, but I feel like it's a little too soon to tell because I'm still like, I kind of just like reached that precipice, like not too long ago where it's like, okay, I'm starting to feel, feel like I feel better than before. But, uh, yeah, I think there's one, there's one exercise that is really telling. It's like, like I could do like one legged squats, like incredibly easy now. Like I could just like, right. like rep out like one legged squats. And I'm like, I could never do this before. Like yeah. what is up with this? And, uh, and then I can, I can also like do like these one handed handstands. I don't know. And then I'm back to like doing muscle ups and I don't know. And like, I've barely trained, you know, it's been like a month mm -hmm. in, in the gym. If that, like, let's see, I started walking three weeks ago. So I've been in the gym for like three weeks. Yeah. So, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, well, that's great. So, well, you know, and, and, and like you say, it is early days. You know, as, as you keep getting better and rehabbing your knee, you're just going to be doing more and more and more. And uh, so I'm interested to see how that goes. How uh, how's it feel? So you're not using any carbs or anything like that. Isn't that, isn't um, that not possible? Yeah. Are you supposed so, to get tired and die? Oh, no. Like, so if I eat carbs, um, sometimes I'll get a little bit depressed or um, I, I won't feel like quite as strong if I like eat if i eat a little bit of carbs like this summer i was experimenting a little bit with like having like some berries and honey with like some cream and mm -hmm. it tasted really good and it was like mm -hmm. wow this is like amazing <laughs> but i definitely like would wake up in the morning and then like have like a stomach ache and maybe a little bit of a headache and my legs would just feel a little bit wobbly and i just feel like so much more I don't know, stable with like out the carbs and my endurance is like no problem. And I think where people get hung up is they, they go keto for a month, two months, three months. And you know, they're still eating 20 carbs, 30 carbs a day. And they're just like confused. Like, why am I gassing out? Like, why don't I have like a high capacity for like, um, you know, like quick short bursts and really it's just your metabolism hasn't had a chance to like switch over. I don't think, um, and like you haven't developed that metabolic capability to like run a, like a bunch of sprints in a row, um, like because you've always been reliant on your whatever your glycogen source. So um, um, I, I think it just takes some time to shift. And really, is there like a difference between like like what's the so like what what's like the major difference between like a ketone, for example, and like a glycogen store in terms of like metabolic? processes so yeah i mean that, that's a good question and we, we don't have have perfect information on this so i mean there you know the traditional argument is that you know a lot of cells will run on carbohydrates or ketones they can run on ketones and that goes into the mitochondria and that generates atp and then some people will say and it's traditionally thought that your muscles will run on glycogen they need that quick energy that you know you know it takes too long to get the the ketones up there but if you have ketones in your blood all the time that's not necessarily the case um the the other side of the argument is that um people like dr kiltz and a number of other um people that i've spoken to and i've i've seen uh you know papers on is they argue that your your cells never run on carbohydrates at all that they get converted into ketones first and then they get run as ketones or into fats and things like that. And so 
It's always running on fats. It's just how efficient are you at, at running on fats and how available are those fats. And so if you're on a keto diet or a carnivore diet, you know, that could be why people have more energy in there and they just don't get tired from sprinting or lifting weights and they recover nearly instantly. Um, there was uh, there was one paper, I think, in 2004 that, um, that I was just discussing with someone previously, and that argued that or showed a bit of evidence that would suggest that after a couple of months on a ketogenic or carnivore diet, that you really just run on ketones and you don't really need to run on any glycogen at all. Um, now, I do remember as well, there was a study with wolves back in 1981 that looked at glycogen levels and blood sugar levels because they were like, well, you need carbs to burn carbs and wolves don't carbo load before they chase caribou for 10 hours. So, you know, you know, do they have blood sugar? Do they have glycogen? They found that yes, they do. And they are rock solid. They don't change. They're just right here. Now the thought there was that they were constantly just perfectly replenishing their glycogen and, and blood sugar, no matter what, how hard they work, they perfectly maintain that. Um, and, uh, and that could be the case with us. I think practically it doesn't really matter. Either we are replacing our glycogen and blood sugar basically instantly as, you know, as, as fast as we can burn it, our body's making it. And the only thing that re is really holding us back is our, is our oxygen debt and building up lactic acid because you go into an anaerobic um, metabolism as opposed to aerobic metabolism. And so you have your oxygen debt and you just get sore and worn down and you have to breathe heavily and, and uh, cycle through all that lactic acid before you can go again. Um, but that the glycogen's just being replenished constantly and you're not going to run out of that, or you're just running on your ketones and you're not going to run out of, and you're definitely not going to run out of that. Either way, the end result is the same. You have boundless energy and you don't tank out. And so it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. And, uh, and I think it'd be great to find that out, but I think practically, you know, the, the results are the same. We're either replenishing our glycogen right away, or we're just running on ketones. There, there are two different camps on that. I'm, I'm a bit agnostic for that. I don't, I don't really care. I'm just happy with the, the practical as aspect. Which right. I've got a buttload of energy. And I, and I, yeah, that's, that's what's important, right? <laughs> like what is the end result? Like for most people, like, unless you're making drugs, I guess. So yeah, exactly. Um, exactly yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the application is like useful for so many different like camps of athletes. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like because in that a carnivore diet naturally lends itself to like a low percentage body fat, uh, high endurance and, um, like increased like hormonal imbalance and strength. And, um, I, I feel like the combination of those things really just makes, can make any athlete better unless you're like a sumo wrestler, maybe, I don't know. Um, but like you think gymnast, like runner, uh, whatever, um, football player, like, I don't know. It, it's like, it, you're doing more with less almost like, so. Yeah. yeah. And that's, uh, that's what it raises the question. You know, you're coaching, you're coaching kids now, obviously you're coaching and wrestling, but are, are, do you talk to them about, about diet and things like that? Um, it's only been like, uh, Let's see. It's only been about three weeks now, but I have mentioned that like, it's so like in wrestling that the culture on cutting weight is so toxic mm. and it like, especially in high school, like, cause these kids, they've never cut weight before. They don't know what's going on. And whenever, like, especially in my freshman and sophomore year, like I went through it, you know, I, I was, I was out there eating like a protein bar for dinner and like trying to make it through this practice. And I just felt like the king of suck, you know, it's just like, uh, I like could barely drag my feet through this workout and it was just tough. And, uh, I know my junior and senior year, I started to change the way I cut weight and I would like go more keto and I would be low carb and I still cut a lot of weight, but, um, I recovered better post weigh in. Um, I had more energy during the weight cut. I, I didn't feel like depressed during the weight cut, which would be like a common thing while I was like eating all these carbs and, it also has the benefit, other benefits, like each gram of carbohydrate holds on like three grams of water or four grams of water or something. Uh, so whenever you eliminate those carbs, I don't know, and fiber. So whenever you eliminate that stuff, like, like most college wrestlers know, you know, don't 
don't eat fiber and carbs before weigh-ins or in salt. Um, but uh, yeah, so carnivore, I mean, for wrestling could really be a solid thing. I, I know Seth Gross, I, I saw a podcast with him and Sean Baker. He, he was, a, I think, a, a world medalist in freestyle mm-hmm. wrestling. And he was a carnivore. And uh, yeah, he uh, a yeah, pretty, pretty solid wrestler. I, I think he wrestled for North Dakota State. He was a D1 national champ for them. But nice. uh, yeah, but yeah, he was solid. And so I actually saw his, his post in that podcast while I was like doing carnivore um, in, in December and January initially. And it was, uh, it was a little inspiring, you know, seeing a fellow wrestler out there and, you know, I, I, I've, of course I had dreams and visions of <laughs> my own. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, look, dude, you, you're already D1, you know, national champ, you know I mean? Like you, you've already hit the dream of nearly every wrestler in the world, yeah. you know? <laughs> I'm not a national champ. I'm an All-American. All-American. Sorry. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Still pretty, pretty. Different. That's right. I know a lot of national champs, and yeah. they don't seem so different from me. Yeah, well, except in the ways that count, I guess. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, well, all American, yeah. So, but I mean, like you know, being an all, a, you know, a collegial American is is massive. You know, I mean, that, yeah. that's that's a, that's a you no, know, it was amazing. Small yeah, club, you know, I really, uh, yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity, and you know, you you see something like that, and you think, oh, that person is just so amazing, but really, it's like there were so many people in my corner and like, I couldn't have done it without those people. And, yeah. um, and yeah, it took, it took work and a lot of, a lot of grinding and, but you know, I accomplished that and you know, yeah. it was something. <laughs> you accomplish it, man. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I wrestled, that was one of my first main sports and I, I really liked it, but I, I wasn't, I didn't have that, that killer instinct when I was mm. in, in high school. It wasn't until, um, you know, I finished up and I, I started playing rugby and, uh, and was an all American in rugby that, that, that sort of around that time, well, some, some things happened in my personal life. Um, it is a bit, you know, my, my brother will probably, probably watch this and he'll be embarrassed by it, but I'll tell it anyway. But like, so we would, we, we fought a lot when we were kids and he, um, you know, he was older than me. He was always a lot bigger than me. And, um, and so, you know, we just, as brothers do, you know, we fought a lot and, you know, I was always sort of in his shadow as far as that was concerned. And, but I, you know, I wrestled and I, I was lucky enough, my wrestling coach, I had, there was a, there was, um, you know, all, we had an all American coach who just finished up. He was, he must've been like 23, 24 or something like that. Uh, Matt Thompson, if I remember correctly, really nice guy, great wrestler. And uh, then Matt Hume who was a fantastic wrestler and also one of the top uh, MMA fighters and certainly top trainer in the world. And uh, so we just had these great, great coaches. And, uh, and so I, you know, I did MMA and then got into rugby and all that sort of stuff. But there was just one point, my brother and I just, just sort of had out. I always had this sort of mental block. I just could never, I could never win a fight with him. And it was just like one day I just, I had enough. I'm like, yep, that's it. You know, I've, I've been wrestling, I've been fighting like, I'm taking this dude down and I was, <laughs> and, I, and I won the fight. And it was just, that was just this break open moment. Like it was just like the, you know, the, the floodgates opened and just all this, like just emotion and baggage of, you know, all this you know, yeah. stuff came out and I was just a different person after that. And, um, and so that's when I, that's when I got my sort of my killer, my killer instinct back. And I was, I was the very yeah. young player the next year. Um, unfortunately, that's awesome. it, bit late for my wrestling career but but I absolutely loved wrestling it, it was an absolute grind there was so much work that goes into it and um but you know I really liked that and I really enjoyed it I was I was um yeah I, I really enjoyed that and then like the next year after that coming back after I was an all-american I was back wrestling with all the guys you know that were still there and they're all getting ready for a state championships and things like that and these guys that that um you know, I would have struggled with the year before, man, I was just cleaning up with them. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, yeah, just a total different. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, your, uh, yeah, your, uh, perception of yourself changed and yeah. And, uh, yeah, so it's massive, but 
you know, it's, um, it's an absolute, it is an absolute grind and I, I love the sport. Um, but yeah, I, I, I thought about that too. You know, like you're, you're coming from an all American, you know, background and you're, uh, coaching these high school kids. Like they, they are just going to like idolize you. Like Jesus Christ, you know, this guy is just done. You know, <laughs> you know uh, yeah, so it's, it's my first time coaching kids. Uh, so <laughs> they're good kids. And, uh, it was funny. Uh, I was on like the way to a giant skate. I didn't even mean to like get into like this whole coaching thing. It was mm-hmm. just kind of the way it worked, but I was on the way to a giants game and I was going to meet my friends there and we we're going to have a good time. And this was like last month. And I don't know, some kid, he's looking a little lost in the giants Jersey. He's like, does this train go to San Francisco? And I'm like, Oh yeah, man. So he's looking lost. So I'd like tell him how to get there and talk to him on the platform. And apparently he's like a wrestler at this local high school that I like wrestled at as a kid. And, nice. you know, I was like, well, you know, I've been looking to get into wrestling coaching all that so i'll do what i can and uh yeah so um i've been uh i've been showing them the basics and Mm -hmm. you know where we're going with that so yeah well i'm sure they appreciate that and you know obviously you know diet is a huge part of that and they'll listen right 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 that's that's the thing i told them like you can stunt your growth cutting weight wrong in high school Mm -hmm. um you can make yourself real miserable and you're just not going to perform your best anyways. So like, why are you doing it this way? If mm-hmm. it's, uh, you know, so, yeah. um, and you know, I, and then I heard back from the kids, they're all telling me their weight cutting horror stories and mm-hmm. you know, how much weight they cut. And I get it, you know, it's like a badge of honor, but you know, I think I should probably be like two inches taller than I am, but I cut yeah. so much weight in high school. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, my little brother cut, you know, he wrestled and he, and, you know, he had some of those stupid stories where, you know, he would cut like, you know, you know, 20, 30 pounds and, you know, a week or something like that. And, um, yeah. it was just bad. And, uh, that was a difference. Like, you know, when I, 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 so I never did that. I was sort of, I was on the bubble. I was probably like, you know, 193, 194, something like that. And then so like, you know, I easily cut down to 190, obviously, but I really could have cut down maybe like be you know, like a lean 178. Um and um or sorry, one yeah, 178. And um probably could have done that. So I was like, I was like slimming down to do that, but then it was just like, no, actually, we don't have anybody yeah. at 215. Like we need you to go up. And so I was like, <laughs> right. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, like, so then I was and then, so then I was like trying to put on weight. So that I could like, you know, stack up, but I'm, you know, 20 pounds, um, under what everybody else was and things like that, because we just did, we did, we didn't have anyone to fill that, that gap. And so I was, I was sort of the closest one. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And I, I did the opposite. I did the opposite whenever I was a junior, yeah. uh, I weighed like 165, maybe 163. And I was pretty lean, I think. And so it was like 160, 152 and one. 45 were the weights. And so I was, I wasn't going to go 160 because I weighed 160, but mm-hmm. the 152 pounder was like, I don't know, like he couldn't wrestle 160 because he wasn't big enough and he couldn't wrestle 145. I don't know. For some reason, they roped me into like wrestling 145 pounds that year. Jeez. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and like it was miserable. It was so bad. But I, I think I ended up like, I think I was maybe ranked, I don't know if I was ranked in the country before then, maybe I was ranked number 20, I don't know. But after that year, I think I was ranked like number two, three in the country, wrestling 145. Yeah. So I really made a big jump and uh, yeah. But man, that was a horrible weight cut, dude. Like I, I would like, I would cut, make weight and then like I'd get home at, after the tournament and I'd weigh like 161, like a, a day and a half late. It's like, like how, like, I don't know yeah so but yeah yeah, that was always my problem was just like the weight and uh you know if i had known about carnivore back then like i don't think it would have been a problem like i would have just known how much i could cut and i would have done it and i probably okay so i i did so i had one weight cut where i was like pretty keto adapted i think i'd like been doing a lot of fasting in 2018 and this is whenever i wrestled 158 and I, I was like lean, uh, wrestling 158, like maybe 5% body fat. 
um, hitting that weight. And, uh, but I'd been doing fasting and for this weight cut, um, I like just, I, I didn't really know about carnivore at the time, but I knew about like M- about MCT oil and like I had like some Greek yogurt and I did this, I did this workout and I lost like six and a half pounds in like an hour, just like jogging. And that was like all the weight I needed to lose. And it was like the easiest weight cut of the year. And it was my first time down at 158. So I don't know, you know, like if you like, yeah. So it's not all just about cutting the weight, you know, it's like what you put in your body, how you're fueling it. Like, um, yeah. So absolutely. Yeah. I was, I was just thinking too, when you said you, you should probably be two inches taller, probably, you know, I'm, I'm six, three. I never really had made major weight cuts, you know, maybe just a few pounds or something like that. Never major. Uh, my little brother did. And, you know, he's 5'10", I'm 6'3", my brother's 6'4". <laughs> That's and, hilarious. You know, my dad yes. and his brother are like mid to upper six foot. Their dad, yeah. like their dad and and his brothers, like born in like the, you know, turn of the 19, uh, you know, hundreds. Uh, those bastards were like pushing seven foot. You know, so we've got tall jeans and yeah, he's 5'10". Yeah. <laughs> I wrestled 215, but Dude. I was really 195. I, I don't need to know this, man. I, <laughs> I don't need any more regrets. Like, you know, my brother's 5'11". Or yeah, he's five eleven and I'm five eight. Yeah. But somebody did just like insult me for saying that they're like, oh, you you're you say you're five eight, and I'm like, I am five eight. I mean, <laughs> five seven and a half. <laughs> like, you know, like, you round up obviously. Point five, five seven and three quarters. Five seven and three quarters. Take math, so. right? <laughs> Anyways, so you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, my younger brother too, though, you know, he cut a lot of weight, but he also had a, had a pretty poor diet too. He just ate uh, white rice with tempura sauce. Like that's just all he loved. So it was just like, you know, like sugar, soy sauce and carbs. That's what he, that's what he ate most growing up. And Mm -hmm. he was much shorter and smaller than we were. And like he, like I wrestled in the 215, but I weighed 195. And, but he wrestled like 148, right? You know, senior year, right? Yeah, that's and so you know, big difference. And uh, but yeah, he ate, he ate, yeah, just a lot of rice, not a lot of meat. You know, not not good. So choice. why? How how was he eating? Like he was just doing that for wrestling, weight cutting, or like um, that was just preference. Was just, he was always a real picky eater. Yeah. So my mom yeah. just couldn't get him to eat, so she okay. just gave him whatever he wanted. But you know that's why you don't negotiate with terrorists, you know, because they're going to keep you know <laughs> demand, making demands. You know, just be like, nope, this is what you're eating. You're going to do it, you know, because it's healthy. I certainly got that. You know, my my terrorist demands of not wanting to eat, you know, vegetables and squash were <laughs> not listened to. Like I had, I yes. ab- absolutely had to eat that garbage. You know, but he was. Um, you know, he was uh, allowed to just eat, eat that crap, unfortunately. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm not picky, so I, I can't relate. You know, I'm like, yeah. But it was, uh, it's, it is a little tough, though, making that transition from like a standard American diet to carnivore. Um, you know, I mean, anybody who like thinks about it, they're like, wow, that doesn't sound that fun only eating meat or you know but the thing i learned like i I heard about it and it's like oh you know they say the inuits they only eat meat and some explorers like the more i eat like only meat the better it tastes sort of thing Mm -hmm. so you get acclimated to like the diet and the food starts to taste better and that's true and it really seems restrictive at first but I mean, food starts to taste better. Like I get more satisfaction out of the meals that I have. Um, and you know, there really is like a good amount of variety. Uh, if you aren't like on the lion diet or whatever, you know, you can have like seafood and, um, pork chicken and like, there's so many different ways. And then if you like tolerate spices and all that, I know you're like pretty strict with it, but, um, you know, um, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how I feel. About I don't know. Yeah. You know? Right. Yeah. You go with how you feel on yes. the, um, I feel right. better without spices, you know? Mm-hmm. And, you know, like you say, 
you know, you, you find a taste for it. And so now at this point, I just really enjoy the taste of meat, just the meat itself. Yeah. I, I don't even use salt anymore. I've just, yeah. I, I noticed myself slowly using less and less salt just, just for, from preference. And now I find that I just like the meat taste on its own without the salt. So I actually prefer it without salt. So, you yeah. know, if, if, you know, we go to a restaurant or something like that and, and there's a bit of seasoning on it, like I'm not, I'm not going to stir up a fuss. I just know that, you know, I might not feel, you know, right. I might have an itchy face. I, I know what you mean. Right. Like Stomach aches or, or something yeah. like that that night. It might be just yeah. something a little off, but you know, look, it's not the end of yeah. the world. And, um, you know, when I get home, you know, I, I cook things the way I, I want to cook them. But yeah, it's, I mean, it's, um, you're right. You know, there's, there are ways of doing it. And I don't think that, yeah. you know, if you, if you yeah. have to use spices and if you prefer that, if you haven't gotten to the point where you really started preferring the taste of meat, yeah. and appreciating it, then yeah, use some mm -hmm. spices. Yeah. I mean, I think I could do it. Um, I don't think like I would like be like totally thrown off by like cutting out the spices. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I'm, I'm still on the coffee. You know, I, 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 I have coffee almost every day with like a bunch of half and half and, mm -hmm. you know, it's like almost like dessert to me at this point. It's just like, so like delicious. Yeah. Like, uh, but you know, I, like if I think about like the day to day, you know, I'd probably feel a little better. I don't know cutting some of that stuff out. Um, yeah. I also like, you're going to hate this, but like, I'm like addicted to diet soda and like, still, don't, don't, still, oh. still, still, oh, I know, I know. <laughs> you, you, know you got over. <laughs> I know. Just wait until I lose my first tooth. Huh? Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, <laughs> no. yep. I, I, but like it hurts my stomach, you know, and like I know I, I, how do I like I don't know I don't know I I know what you mean, and I'm not perfect, you know, and uh, yeah, <laughs> but I feel like you're at this point in your life where you can just like be like, okay, this doesn't serve me, you know, this like isn't something that is making my life better, and like so many people aren't don't have that mentality like mm -hmm. the 95 percent of people don't have that mentality i don't think and you know really to be able to like look at your actions objectively like from you know aside from how you feel like with your you know addiction or whatever you're like craving for something i don't know like it's like not like i feel like you have that really dialed in you know where you can cut a lot of that stuff out and I don't know. I don't know if most people are there though. But. Yeah. And true. And, but I think that it's also not everybody, you know, sort of sees it as, as in the same way as I do. You know I mean? I look at these things and I've objectively looked at them and said, okay, that's, that's harmful to me. And I don't want that in my body because I don't, I don't want to harm myself directly. You know, just like I don't want to, you know, take, take opiates and different things like that. You know, when I, when I would get injuries or surgery and I would, I would, you know, have painkillers, I would actually really enjoy them because, you know, you know, playing high level sports, as you know, your body hurts all the time and you don't even recognize it because it's just a constant. And then, so you have something yeah. that's hurt, that's actually injured and you take a pill to help your knee or whatever. <laughs> and then the rest of your body and your back and your neck, you go, Oh my God, you know, then not, all that yeah. pain is gone and you don't, you didn't even realize it was there until it was gone. And like, Oh, it's amazing. And so, you know, that's, yeah. Nice. And so, you know, I would, I would look at that and go like, wow, that, I, that's really enjoyable. I can see yeah. the, the appeal to this. Um, but you know, after a few days of that, it's just like, Hey, I, I gotta go. I've got to use my brain. I've got to do stuff. I've got to like get to the gym. I've got to work out. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't have this mm -hmm. crap in my system. I don't feel good. You know, mm -hmm. it's not helping me. And so, right. you know, I, thankfully right. I had that, that sort of mentality, but you know, so I look at that and just be like, this is not good for me. I don't want this in my body. You might use it medicinally or, you know, something, you know, sometimes or whatever, depending on the situation. But in general, if right. I find something that's harmful for me, I don't want it, you know, and, um, and not everybody's right. Like that. But you know, a lot yeah. of people are, if they understand yeah. it the way I do, you know, well, that's just an attitude of like delaying gratification. I feel like, like, um, you know, you look at like the long-term outcomes of things and mm -hmm. you make your decision based on like, um, 
what that's going to look like at a baseline. And so I don't know, like there, there's like certain things you can do like steroids, right. And like, you can get like super jacked and for a short amount of time, but like, you know, you see people that get off steroids and they look like shit and like, or, you know, they have other health issues like a large tart. And so you can like rev up the engine and, you know, really get things going. But, um, uh, it's just, uh, at the sacrifice of longevity and, yeah. You think of like, you think of these other things and you think of, you can think of like an opiate or I don't know, maybe like uh food is like your cr- emotional crutch. And so you're like trying to like maintain your emotional state, like in a general sense of positivity and you're using these, you know, crutches to, like boost it. And um, you end up like with a lower baseline, right? Alcohol, opiates, whatever. Um, so being able to like cut those things out that really, and I feel like people don't realize that like the baseline could be like so much higher than what they expect. Mm-hmm. Uh, at least that's my experience. Like I feel like my baseline is better and I'm not perfect uh, right now. Um, you know, but uh, my baseline is definitely higher and yeah. So, yeah, this is, this is why I'm, I'm jealous of, of people like yourself and others who are still in like that fighting age. We actually can still go and compete at a, like a, you know, world-class level because I, I mean, obviously I got real lucky in my early twenties. I just happened upon this. And so I was doing carnivore for five years and just felt like a bloody superhero and was able to yeah. perform at a, at a really high level. Um, but then I slipped off of it. I didn't realize it, but now I'm back on it. I know what I'm doing. And I really, I really know how to do it. Right. And, um, you know, I've, I've, I've got a, Freaking job! I've got these. Yep. I gotta do. Yeah, like, right. You, uh, you're, you're saving lives out here. So, yeah. well, <laughs> and um, well, you know, and then also, yeah. you know, just I've, I've just battered up my knees, and so I have, you know, anytime I try to go run or sprint or something like that, I just get my knee swells up, just get an effusion, mm-hmm. and so I'm trying to rehab that, and I've had mm-hmm. like surgery to sort of like clean up all the little flaky mm-hmm. pieces and stuff like that, and I'm trying to rehab it. So maybe I get back, and I will tell you. If I can get back to running and sprinting without my knee blowing up, like I will be playing again and I will be crushing people. And I was thinking yes. about this too, because I've been doing the, the knees over toes guy right. routine and it's actually helping. It's actually helped quite a yes. lot. Right. And right. yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, so people that have knee problems, I, I definitely recommend go going and checking him out, but I just have this sort of fantasy in my head that I'm going to like be able to rehab my knees. And then and then go out and just start playing. I'm just gonna get like a yeah, video yeah. of me just absolutely crushing people. <laughs> and just be like, you know, like, hey, thanks, you know, yeah. thanks, Ben. You know, you, you know this, Wait, is, this is how this old are you now? You're this like, guy going to the hospital <laughs> because of you. Thanks, buddy. Jesus. Yeah. yeah, I feel yeah. You what are you like for, so what are you like 40, 40 what? Forty three. Forty three. Dude, yeah. whenever I saw that, like I was like showing people around my house. I'm like, dude, how old does this guy look? And they'd be like 35. And I'm like, bro, like 33. I don't know. I could have sworn. I was like, they're like, it was like a YouTube clip. And it was like, you'll never guess how old this person is. I don't know. And it was like, you were like 43. And I was like, holy shit. Like, I guess. And I was like 35. No more. Like, yeah. no older. And like, I was like, and then there's that lady you just posted. Um, 60 years carnivore or something. She's 82. Yeah. 65 years or something. Yeah. And uh, she looks fantastic. Like she looks like she's 60 years old and she's mm-hmm. 82. It's just like, wow. Like what, like how could we like oversee like such a, you know, amazing, like, you know, health protocol. Like, mm. I don't know. Well, and she, and she's pretty, impre- so she is uh, really more than 65 years, really pretty much lifelong because okay. she was, she was like me. She hated vegetables and she just, just refused to eat them. But like her parents, instead of being sadists like mine and forcing her to eat them, they are <laughs> just eat meat. And so yeah. they, uh, yeah. So she just, just basically ate meat most of her life. And because they're like, well, you know, she's skinny, she's healthy, you know, just let her, let her do her thing. But then, you know, I put 65 because when she moved out of the house, that's when she was just like, another vegetable will never pass my lips. You know, yeah. <laughs> that's so, yeah. Wow. She just, yeah, she just knew not to eat them. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and those things, she raised six kids or had six kids. Unfortunately, one, one passed away. So five, five kids to adulthood. 
um, and then has has others through uh, marriage. And, you know, but but all her pregnancies were carnivore and these kids are all very tall. Like her daughter is like 5'10", 5'11". Her grandkids are all like 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, the boys, or at least a couple of the boys uh, that I met. And, you know, very, very healthy. And, you know, she did it just, just eating meat. And the thing is that she looks great and she does, but she moves like a healthy 30-year-old. You know, wow, she's yeah, that, climbing up and down tractors mm-hmm. and farm equipment. They have a sailboat that they're building and they're going to they're gonna you know go sailing around the world with that. And she was like climbing up a mast and like grabbing things, pulling it down. She literally hopped over a fence into a cow patch <laughs> with a bull with an actual <laughs> raging bull who had sort of got into like the yeah. adjacent pen um, or pasture with this no, uh, other bull that had a, you know, had a harem of cows and like this big ass dominant bull wanted in there. He wanted to, he wanted no to kill the way. other bull and, and take over the cow. And she, this was the largest bull I've ever seen in my entire life. This guy was a monster. It was, his name was Growler and he was really grumpy. A uh, massive, massive, big bull. And he was huge. And she just goes, she literally, just, just without a thought, just like hops over. He goes like, growl, get over here. He's like grabbing it, you know, slap him, come on, you know. And like, I was just like, oh my God. And it was like, you you would never in your life think that this was, this was an 82 year old woman. You no. know I mean? She, no. <laughs> you know, she was climbing yeah. up and down some of this equipment, like better than I would, you know, I was just like, I was like, oh, my back kind of hurts. You know, she was right up there, you know. And yeah, it's, you know, it's I don't, yeah, there's a lot of like people, people talk about like how the way people, how to change the way you move, but some people just have it, you know, they just like, she's been moving right her whole life and mm-hmm. she's kept moving and, and you know, all that stuff's related. I feel like, you know, it's like your emotions, your diet, like your, the way you move, you know, I don't know, it's all related to your health and longevity and mm-hmm. yeah, but yeah. I bet she goes to bed at 8 p.m. every or 9 p.m. every night probably doesn't watch TV probably no. uh, gets up no some, it doesn't yeah. doesn't watch TV they yeah. they apparently though they've started watching some sailing videos now they're sort of getting ready to go sailing so they're sort of learning okay about that. so they watch nice. that on like YouTube uh, but mm-hmm. yeah it was um, you know we'd have well I stayed with them for you know five days uh, you know my girlfriend Elle and I did and uh, you know lovely people they were up every morning and out with the cows at 5 a.m. every yep. day. Yeah. Yeah. I, that used to be me uh, whenever I was a kid. Uh, I grew up on a ranch and, nice. you know, so some, sometimes you want to have a ranch hand, uh, you know, available. And so I'd be out there at whatever, 6, 530, mm-hmm. shoveling the stalls and, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. you get it done. Yeah. 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 Luckily, we had power tools. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um yeah, so and then yeah, so we'd have we'd have dinner and things like that in the evenings and probably around nine o'clock it was like, yep, nine o'clock, time to go to bed. And um yeah, then be up yeah. five o'clock out the door. That's important, right? Circadian rhythm, like mm-hmm. it's just um yeah, there's so much like stuff I wish I could like talk with you about. You know, I just feel like I've I've gone down a lot of rabbit holes, but um yeah, there's just so many cool, so much cool stuff on the internet out there, you know, mm-hmm. um, movement, circadian rhythm, like, uh, like meditation type stuff, breath work, uh, mm-hmm. diet. And yeah, I mean, but really it's like, if you want to solve the mystery, it's like, think about like what people did like 15,000 years ago, 30,000 years ago. And it's like, all right, you know, before like everything got all messed up by all of these systems and, um, people telling other people the way things should be. Yeah. Um, I don't know. So, yeah. But, well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it should, it should be pretty natural. It should just happen mm-hmm. on its own. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, that's how, that's how the right. world is supposed to work. We forget that, you know, because we grow right. up in modern society, but, you know, we're designed for, you know, long before modern society existed. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're designed for something else. And, we're designed to right. live naturally with the world and we're, we're not doing mm-hmm. that. And I think we're right. suffering as a result. I mean, just because humans are whatever, I don't know, 2 million years old. Um, I mean, those humans had parents too, and mm-hmm. those parents had parents and I don't know. So, you know, it's like, we're, I mean, I don't know, just because like we have these traits doesn't mean like we still aren't bound, you know, it's like yeah. bound by like the laws of nature. So, 
Uh, yeah, well, but, right. Just yeah. because we're intelligent and we live in houses doesn't mean that we're not animals, you mm-hmm. know, and that those those physical laws don't apply to us. They absolutely right. do. And, you know, you forget that at your own peril. You know, you, right. you know, we're, you know it's, it's the old, old adage, you know, you're so sharp, you'll cut yourself. Like we are there. You know, we think that we're just so brilliant, so wonderful that we're just basically gods and, and we can just do whatever we want. And, and physical laws uh, and biological laws don't apply to us anymore. And, uh, the you know, if we because we're intelligent, they think that, well, if we were intelligent, you'd recognize that, nope, that's not the case. And that you can't you can't uh, duck reality and you can't duck biology. And what the smartest thing you could do would be is like you say, look back 15,000 years, 30,000 years, 100,000 years. What were they doing? How were they living? That's how we were designed to live. Uh, at least how we're designed to eat and, you know, be in the sun and be outside. Oh, never go in the sun. Are we troglodytes? You know, do we, are we chugs? Yeah, right. We it's it's the amazing, sun? right? <laughs> what is, yeah, what is uh, up with that? Why, out there. why is that the common opinion? Like, it's just like, who started saying that? And, yeah. you know, I could go into all the stuff about why that's bullshit. And, I don't know, you know. <laughs> But yeah, uh, it's, uh, I saw this video today and it was like some natural tribes people mm-hmm. and uh, I don't know, it was just some, some dude singing the song, uh, from like Papua New Guinea or something. And he's, wa- apparently it's the song they sing whenever they like walk home from returning from the forest. Mm-hmm. And some dude had like, he'd like acapella it kind of. So like he had like a bunch of like harmonies and reverb. But it's just like the most beautiful, like, like harmonious, resonant sound. And it like almost brought tears to my eyes in this moment because it was like the song of like coming home or something, Hmm. you know? And so it was just like this feeling of like being at peace and like being part of something. And I just feel like that's like something that we lose, miss out on being so disconnected from nature. Hmm. I don't know. Um, Just like with entertainment and school and um you know hierarchies of like where we should be at this time and uh, it's just like i feel like these spiritual things that like people have to work so hard for it maybe they used to come a little more naturally i don't know yeah i think so and especially now with the internet and you have so many things at your fingertips and that can be very useful but can also be very distracting and you end up just sort of caught on social media and the internet and all these sorts of things. I, 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 have, I have trouble with it as well. Like I hate social media, but unfortunately, yeah. you know, you need to use it because that's where, that's where the people are and that's how you reach them. Mm-hmm. And yet I find myself, you know, getting distracted by things and, and taking a lot of time and thinking like, I have so many messages to answer. I have so many things that I should do. Right. I always feel that I always, that's always what I should be doing instead of like, no, I need to do this other thing now. And I need to just put that to the side, which was, which was, it was actually nice the last few weeks when I was traveling, uh, you know, visiting Maggie and then I was at Yellowstone, there was no service. And so like, I didn't even have an option to do that. It was so nice. I was just, uh, yeah. <laughs> it depends on who you ask though. Like, you, yeah. I guess that maybe means you aren't that addicted, you know, like, you know, you're not like, I don't know. Like for me, I if I want to be addicted. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. I mean, for, I know what, Whenever I was 18, I disconnected. I went on like my first backpacking trip in the Sawtooths and I went by myself and obviously no cell service. I brought like a couple books and it was, it was nice. It was really good, but I can't, I would be lying if I said I didn't think about like checking my phone and like wanting, like having like, I don't know, wanting to have cell service. And, mm-hmm. But yeah, you know. But so you're 43, I'm 27. So you had, you kind of grew up without cell phones then and all of that. You're like, you didn't probably get a cell phone until you were like 20, like five or something or 20. 20 something, early 20s, like maybe 22, yeah. something like that. Yeah. yeah. But I, I got my first cell phone. Yeah. I think I was, Same. my first like smartphone, I think I was 14 or so, mm. or smartphone. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna get my kids that shit. No, don't, please, do not. Like, um, yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, not only is it like addicting, but I, apparently, I don't know. I heard this thing where kid, like, kids are like more susceptible to like 
like they're more like they're more easily addicted to devices than adults and it has something to do with their like physiology and like and like the light it's like being emitted like i don't know it's like the light is addicting from the screens for some reason and so like i guess as you age you like develop a natural protection to this like light i don't know Mm. that's uh some podcasts i was listening to couldn't give you the specifics but yeah um, maybe you just you know what you're earlier jack cruz yeah well jack jack cruz is cool as hell so yeah yeah he's, yeah. he's said it there's probably something behind it but yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that that hebrew podcast yeah so. so it could be that you know you're just more susceptible to stuff when you're a kid and then you become you know a bit you know i guess accustomed to it and, and conditioned to using it and then that's just mm-hmm. what you're used to doing right but yeah. you know i as an adult have certainly right. found myself having difficulty like getting off my damn phone you know because i always mm-hmm. think like there's something there i'm supposed to do because you know i'm i'm you know probably like you like there I, I need to be busy i need to have me doing things and so it's just like i i and i always am busy so i always have things to do and so i'm constantly thinking like shit there's something i need to do something i need to do so because i do a lot of work and and stuff on my phone i'm constantly looking to my phone i should be doing something so there's something here i'm missing there's something here mm-hmm. that I, I need to be doing and so i keep mm-hmm. checking back and i keep thinking i'm like there's something i need to do on this phone but i don't know what it is and it's uh, and, it, and it ends up being just nothing really and i just answering messages right. which i need to do but i get really distracted and I, you know, I, I tried reading a book, you know, a while ago, not a big book. It was like a small book. It was, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, what was it? The Lost World by uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Not a big book. Very interesting. I've been wanting to read this for a long time. And my God, I could, I was getting like a few pages in. I was just getting like, there's something I have to do. I have to check something. I have to check a message. I have to check this. <laughs> it was absolute pain, but I just I ground my way through it and, but it took a long time. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'd have the same reaction to Sherlock Holmes myself, but yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now that I've read, I, I've, I've cracked it open and I'm like, okay, like, I don't know. Well, I'm more of a Stephen King, like, you know, well, is it, well this isn't, isn't um, Sherlock Holmes. This is, this is about like finding right, like right. dinosaurs in South America and things like that. And it's right, like right. raised plateau. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. So it's, 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 it's like, they're it's, on... it's more exciting, you know, and okay. um, there's, there's stuff going on, but, just reading anything, I was just getting so distracted. Even like reading for yes. work, you know, mm-hmm. like I, I'd be reading, you know, uh, you know, like a paper or or like a textbook or something like that, and I just get so distracted, I get like anxious, and like there's something I'm missing. And, and some of that part of that is to do with work as well, because we 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 communicate through you right. know text and things like that on like WhatsApp, on like what's going on and who's covering surgeries and who's doing all this sort of stuff. So I'm like, you know, you, you have to stay on top of those sorts of things. So I'm a bit neurotic on that as well, because I'm constantly having to check that. So I'm, I'm reading this, I'm like, Ooh, I should check something. And it, it just really distracts me. So I, that's something that uh, didn't used to happen. I used to like actually be able to, uh, you know, sit down and actually read or study or work on a project. Even though I was a really bad procrastinator, I could, I could, I could do it. I could get it done. Um, now I find it's, it's more of a struggle. And yeah. I also, I also recognize like, you know, my memories, screwed up too. This is something Vinnie Tortorich uh, pointed out, something I've noticed as well. He asked me in an interview, he's like, you know, how many phone numbers do you know? So I'll ask you, how many phone numbers do you know? <laughs> oh man. I, 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 if I said three, I think I would be lying. Like it might be two. Like, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think I actually remember four. They're all my, either my cell phone address, my parents' phone number, my childhood phone number and my like ch- really like like California childhood phone number. Um, and uh, yeah. And, and myself, yeah. So at four, that's what I got. Whereas before I had a cell phone you, and you didn't have this stuff in your phone, like yeah. you had to just remember people's numbers. And yeah. like, I remember um, every now and then I just sort of like had all these numbers in my, um, in my head. It was just like, Oh, this is this person's number, this person's number. And I remember thinking, I'm like, what if I just forget that? And I'm not going to have his number. I'm not going to have any way of looking it up. And so I just like wrote it down. So I started like writing out all the numbers that I could remember. It was like 150, like 150. Wow. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and now I've got four. Right. So, right. Yeah. So yeah, I guess not everything stakes 
But no, I, I, I had a philosophy professor a lot, like maybe it was 2017, it was ancient philosophy and his advice to us, I don't know, we were like some sophomores and he was just like, you guys just need to work on your memory. Like mm. that is so important. Like you always, like if you like read things, like try to memorize them. And especially, and I guess that's, you know, with like Greek philosophy and, you know, works of art like that, like that can be a good thing. I'm not going to say I, I took it to heart entirely, mm. but you know, I've like memorized a couple poems, I guess. And my mom's like, but I wish there was more, you know, yeah. it's like, yeah, my mom and her side of the family, like they, they could just, they just poems in particular, yeah, and songs. They, they just remember these things. Yeah, um, the, the, like, the songs will run through my head, but yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, that's something anyway. Um, and I guess you could sort of do it the same way with poetry. You know, you have it sort of, you know, the the meter and pattern, you know, of of the poems. Yeah, it's just whenever you get, like, you have like a little portal in your pocket, and you can kind of just like see the exact freaking. Then yeah. well, it's, you know, the, you know, speaking of ancient philosophy, like the ancient philosophers, um, you know, in Greece, like they were, a lot of them were against the written word. They said that that was, that was going to destroy people's memories. So, well, if you can write something down, then you don't need to remember it. Everything was memorized. And, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey, these were complex, epic poems that are thousands of pages long. And that was all oral tradition. Uh, that was, yeah. that was, that was written. It was composed um in someone's brain and they just sort of and they just mm -hmm. said this stuff and, they, and it was a perfect you know meter and and for thousands of pages and someone right. composed that in their head and never wrote it down and passed it down generation after generation um just through oral tradition alexander solzhenitsyn who wrote the gulag yeah. archipelago he did something similar to that. He was in he was in the gulags in Russia. He was there for eight years. And in his head, he was writing a book that later became the Gulag Archipelago um, that that was basically telling everybody how horrendous and evil this system was, the, the, the communist system was. And he didn't have anything to write it down on. And if he did write it down, it would either be confiscated or he'd be tortured and killed for having written it. And so he wrote it in his head and he would just like repeat the lines to himself over and over again. He had rosary beads and he would just be, as he was out there working, he'd just be clicking these rosary beads on, on repeating his own chapters back to himself. This book is 2,700 pages long. He composed it all in his head and then wrote it all out, spent years writing this stuff out and then, and then got it out there. So you know, that's what the brain is capable of. That's what we are capable of. We're capable of doing this. And and I think we've we've gotten so much technology that we've really dumbed ourselves down because we, we don't okay. need to be smart anymore. We don't need to have intelligence. You know, people think that we're so much more intelligent because we have all this technology. Well, someone had to make the technology. That's really smart. You're not the one who made it. Right. So, you know, you're just using it and then you're you don't have to develop your brain because this is such an easy crutch. And, right. Um, and it has to do with like, I don't know, the way that school's designed, you know, it's like, oh, here's an assignment you, and it's like, I don't know, like, I don't know, I guess that that's one way of going about it. But it's also like, if you're trying to be like an effective person, like the world is so much more complex than this little mm -hmm. prompt, you know, that you have uh, for the assignment. And I don't know, like, if you are able to have like, that sort of I don't know that sort of was knowledge in your head like at your disposal like that that just changes the way you think and mm -hmm. you know it's it, it it makes you more effective i don't know and i'm you know i'm just a normal whatever 27 year old kid addicted to instagram and tiktok and you know um it's uh but, but you know, I, there's to visions be. of being better, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And uh, yeah. Yeah. But um, I was going to ask you too. So what, what did, uh, well, first of all, congratulations on graduating. Um, you know, that's great that you were able to, to get back and do that. So congratulations uh, there. Um, and uh, what, what did you end up uh, graduating with and what do you, what are you planning to do with that? Yeah. So I graduated with uh, a degree in applied economics and management, which is like business and it's it's a pretty good it's a really good program and it's really awesome um but i really struggle in office environments for some reason uh, 
Um, I just uh, don't have fun. I- I've had a few like internships and uh, that sort of thing. So I'm actually just going to be like a substitute teacher this year. I was going to be like an English teacher in high school, but so I'm still like looking actively for that. But um, right now I'm just being a substitute and uh, you know, it's uh it's not like the most glamorous job and you know, but I think helping kids is a good thing and it is. Um yeah. So and it's something I think I'll enjoy and um yeah. So well, and it also gives you gives you time to think about things, you know. And it may be that you really enjoy it and you want to go full time right. in teaching. You never know. You know, but yeah. it's you know, education for education's sake is is a good thing and you know, nothing you learn during that degree, even if you don't go into business per se or economics, you know, that will that will benefit you in everything that you do. Um, right. Just giving you that base of education and knowledge and that perspective, that difference in perspective is going to be very mm-hmm. unique and beneficial. So, right. yeah, so that's good. Man. No, it was really good. I really appreciate, you know, everything I went through with all of that. And, uh, you know, it's a... It is a unique opportunity to get to go to a school like that. And mm-hmm. um, so, yeah, it's uh, I, I, I visited there a couple of times. Right. Already. Yeah, I went to um, his MBA there. And, uh, and so I, I went up to Ithaca. Nice. It was gorgeous. Like, gorgeous. right. Dude, it's, it's, it, gorgeous. it's on the woods. Right. You know, the <laughs> you know, right there. It's unbelievable, right? Yeah. You, know, I'm, you know, the campus is like it's like something out of like a medieval you know, uh, city and like, I just went to, like through the, like the fraternity and sorority houses, they're like castles. These are like yeah. manor houses yeah. with like, you know, big like, castle <laughs> blocks for building blocks. It's crazy. Yeah. You'll get spoiled living out there. You know, it's yeah. like winters are not so fun, but no. you know, <laughs> <laughs> you also have a sauna, ice bath, full wrestling room, gym. Yeah. And you know, it's, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty special. So, yeah, that's um, awesome. But so, yeah, we we actually have a few guys competing from Cornell um, in the World Championships. Oh, nice! In two weeks from now, nice. um, Vito Aruja, who was a national champ this last year, his first national champ championship, Badass. and then uh, Kyle Dake, he's down at Penn State now, uh, but he's a four time world champ, going for his fifth world championship. Jesus. He's also one of five um four-time d1 national champs uh jesus uh, yeah so he's super impressive and yeah. unfortunately there's, there's this other guy yanni i'll mention him too because he's also a four-time national champ for cornell and uh but he he didn't he lost in the the world team trials finals this year mm-hmm. so uh but i'm sure he'll be there for the olympics and yeah yeah so yeah so i mean presumably all those guys would be going for an olympic spot too Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, that would just be like, I don't know. Yeah. I think they can all go for an Olympic spot, their own weights. So if they can all make it, that would just be like yeah. ridiculous. But yeah, I, I didn't realize Cornell had such a strong wrestling program. Actually, that's pretty badass. Yeah. No, we always have some standouts and I, it's hard to compete with like Penn state the way they are right now. Um, mm. But Cornell's pretty good. Um, they've got the new coach in Mike Gray. I think he's doing a great job, uh, but uh, yeah, he, I didn't wrestle under him though. I, I was under the old head coach, so. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was assistant coach while I was there, so. Okay. But it seems like I wasn't sure. How, you know, I was like, I don't know, like it's a big job, but yeah. you know, he killed it, and yeah. So. No, that's really good. Well, cool. Um, anyways, yeah, Cornell. Well, what's that, sorry? I said, anyways, Cornell wrestling and all that. I had to throw the shout outs out there. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, no, that's cool <laughs> yeah. that they're doing so well. Yeah, I, I, I did not realize that they, um, you know, were doing so well and had such, such a good program. But that's great, you know, especially because, yeah. like, you know, you know, if you if you're a good enough athlete and a scholar and you want to go to a school like Cornell, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. you have to sacrifice your athletic dreams to to go to a school that's just you know a, a better academic school or or better. Uh, school for other yeah. reasons it's just mm-hmm. you know because it you know quite often different schools have better sports programs they they put more of an onus on that and so being able to go to a school you know a great right. school like cornell um you know has a very high academic standard but also you know compete in your sport at a top level too i mean that's you know that's that's a win-win 
No, yeah, it's it's an opportunity, and you know, everything in life has trade offs. Like you put more energy into wrestling, you're gonna have less energy for school and and all that. But uh, you know, you know, you see it time like there's not really many people who are like 4.0 at Cornell and like all American. You know, it's like mm-hmm. it's pretty tough to balance. So uh, yeah, but yeah, it's awesome. I mean, I'd I'd recommend it, and they have a need based financial aid. So even if like, you know, like I know I had, I had like a few teammates and, you know, they were on like full, like need based aid mm-hmm. and they weren't like the most amazing wrestlers and, but they got to, you know, go to Cornell, they didn't pay too much. And so it's like a good thing, you know, like these, these kids, like they probably paid like less to go to Cornell than they would to like, I don't know, CSU Brock or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, Brockport University out there in New York. And like, I don't know. So, yeah, it's a good That's thing. Really yeah, yeah. Um, I was going to ask you too. You know, we we touched on your um, your mental health stuff, the, the anxiety and depression and things like that. Um, how's that going now? Yeah. So, in terms of my, so the anxiety is way less. I think. Uh, I don't know what your gauge on like my anxiety levels are. I know they're not like you know, dead silent, but, um, they're they're definitely less than I think they were. Um, like absolutely. Like I could also like my social anxiety is a lot lower. So Mm -hmm. I, am like a lot less self-conscious and more like outwardly directed. And so I, I don't know exactly like why, but, um, it definitely has something to do with (laughs) shifting my diet and being like more metabolically, you know, efficient or active, whatever the terminology is, and then maybe some lower inflammation and, um, but so there's that. And then depression, I mean, you know, I, I have some tough days. I I think I just, I went through a breakup recently. So, Mm. um, that, you know, you, you you have some rough days, but like I bounced back and like, um, and you know, things are all right. And, and then before, like, you know, I was just like in this rut and I couldn't get out. Like, I don't know. It was just like, I couldn't lose weight. Like, it was just like, you know, I was living life, but was I like really living life? I don't know. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, overall, it's just, it just like feels like so much better to be in a healthy body and healthier mind and, um, you know, I feel like, I feel like a lot of people know that, you know, they know that they'd feel better if they lost weight and they'd feel better if they, you know, had better mental health. And, but the general guideline, it's like, okay, eat less and exercise more. Right. That's like rule one and two. And, um, I, I feel like we've had enough time to see that that doesn't really work for most everyone. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I, my mom actually just recently started the carnivore diet. She's oh, yeah? 63. Yeah. Uh, she, she's not like, she's kind of on the same boat as me. She'll eat like, um, cheese still. And, um, she'll eat like these keto yogurts, which are like mostly cream. I don't know. So, but you know, She's, uh, but she's doing like, you know, keto vor type deal. And, uh, yeah, she, she's definitely gotten healthier. Her skin is like more vibrant. Um, she's, uh, I feel like her mood is generally better. I feel like she's like walking better too. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, I feel like anyways, I guess my point is, is that like, not like it might sound kind of weird, like do a carnivore diet to some people and like be a little off putting, but um, there's like real benefit to be had and like, um, and yeah, maybe, maybe it doesn't work for everyone. I don't know if I believe that, but you know, (laughs) um, yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's awesome, man. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear your mom's doing well too. And, uh, I'm sure that that'll get better. So, uh, well, John, thank you so much for coming on, man. Yeah, no, it was awesome. Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, you're, you're great. You know, I love <laughs> all the content you put out there and, uh, it was really helpful too. So thanks for all that oh, and, you know, figuring out what I should do. And then, you know, those first two months, um, 
you know, getting off medication, all that, um, yeah. and being real strict on carnivore. That was like definitely instrumental because I'd done keto before and like, I didn't have the same success I had this time for mm-hmm. some reason. And it was those two months of really strict carnivore that for some reason, like made a difference later on when I switched to like, and, and you know, I just, I wasn't all in, I wasn't all out, but you know, I did my best on like the school dining hall plan to eat mostly meat and, you know, stay like have low carb intake. And, um, yeah, so I got through the school year and now it's like, it's not a chore to, to eat this way. So yeah, yeah good. <laughs> Anyways. So thanks again. Yeah. No, you're welcome, man. Thank you very much. And, um, and how, how do people get a hold of you? What, what are some of your socials and things like that? Yeah, my social media, it's uh, Instagram is at John J. Chavez, J O N J A Y Chavez. And um, yeah, that's my social. And then my email is the same at gmail.com if you want to email me. So cool. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. We'll, we'll put those up. And um, yeah, if people want to get hold of you and, and uh, ask any questions, they can, they can do that there. John, thank you so much for great. coming on. It's been a pleasure. All right. Super great. Uh, hopefully, we can stay in touch. Absolutely, man. Looking forward to it. All right, Dr. Chafin. Hey, guys. Thank you very much for taking the time out to listen to what I had to say. If you like it, then please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel and podcast. And if you're on YouTube, then please hit that little bell and subscribe. And that'll let you know anytime I have a new video out, which should be every week, if not more. And if you could share this with your friends, that would help me get the word out and let me know that you like what I'm doing. Thanks again, guys. The the problem is, is that with the tobacco companies for decades, they lied, said, oh, there's no evidence of that. Look at all these studies. Oh, look at these nice studies. All the studies that they paid for. And these studies say all great things. Well, these studies say that you're full of it. Well, but ugh, we just got these studies. There's conflicting evidence. Who knows what's going on?